Professor Edgar Kahn, and I am both a professor of law and founder of Time Banking and founder of Time Banks USA. When I hear an introduction like that, I'm grateful that it's short. Longer introductions begin to sound like obituaries. I remember when I was nominated for Ashoka, I wrote Bill Drayton, do you have some age limit or am I going to be your geriatric Ashoka fellow? And he wrote back saying, no, but you can't just keep doing what you've been doing. You've got to come up with something new. And I wrote him back saying, I don't think that's going to be a problem because I haven't figured out yet what I'm going to do when I grow up. I'm hoping to learn one day, but not any day soon. I am going to tell you, though, about what I think is a different kind of social entrepreneurship and a different kind of social enterprise because I need to explain to you that when we think about economics, we're in fact looking at only part of the map. I didn't know whether we'd be able to get this up here, so I brought my own high-tech piece. And I'm simply going to say that if this is an economic map and you want to get from here to there, it's probably not too smart to tear off a third of it because you're not going to get there. All of our economic planning omits at least a third of the map, according to even Nobel Prize winner Gary Becker and some other folks. It omits an economy that I think you need to be aware of. It's the one you go home to each night. It's called home, family, neighborhood, community, civil society. It probably doesn't do anything very important from the point of the GDP, gross domestic product. It just raises children, makes neighborhoods safe and vibrant, raises strong families, takes care of the elderly, gets involved in things like elections, tries to make democracy work, tries to hold officials accountable, fights for social justice, tries to keep the planet sustainable, but nothing of economic importance, you understand. So the first proposition I have to say to you is that we need to understand that there is a core economy, that there's a core economy that is fundamental. It's so fundamental, I'm going to ask you to think about it with an analogy of a computer. We have on a computer screen all of these powerful icons that are very powerful specialized programs. But all of us know, whether it's Windows or Linux or whatever, underlying those powerful programs is an operating system. That operating system goes down... Nothing works. Programs crash. Our monetary system runs those powerful specialized programs. But the core operating system is family, neighborhood, community, civil society, networks, and formal support systems. And if we don't rebuild that economy, we're in trouble. And folks, we're in trouble. Because that old economy, to a degree that we never really admitted or acknowledged, was in fact subsidized by labor exacted from the subordination of women, the exploitation of minorities, the exploitation of immigrants, and in many nations, the exploitation of children. And as we move forward, hopefully with progress, we're going to have to rebuild an operating system that does these minor things like raise children, keep neighborhoods safe, make democracy work, and fight for social justice. We're going to have to find a way to rebuild that operating system, that core economy. And that's what the new social enterprise system is really about. So that's the first proposition. We've got to be aware of that whole economy. The second proposition I want to put to you is that most notions of entrepreneurship involve, I create something, maybe it's a new light bulb, maybe it's an organic food product, maybe it's something that feeds off of solar and I sell it. Well, the bad news is that you can create and sell and deliver something like pizza. You can create and deliver packages, but you cannot create and deliver by unilateral delivery systems health, education, welfare, community justice, or democracy. Those involve a fundamentally different relationship with the people whom you're, quote, helping. In fact, you can't do it if you do not enlist them as co-workers and co-producers of the outcomes you're seeking to achieve. And the question is, how do you enlist them? Because it's going to take a very different system from the ones that we're used to creating, the ones that we're used to thinking in terms of bottom line and profit margins and so forth. Third proposition I want to tell you is that we're going to have to create a new kind of what I'll call a social Prius. 
something that runs on two kinds of fuel. It's going to run on a thin stream of money, but it's going to run on a large stream of psychic energy. Now, that psychic energy may be conscience, it may be compassion, in my culture it's guilt, but nonetheless, but it's going to run on something other than just money alone. And there's a reason for that. Money operates on one value system. We're clear on that. It defines value by price. Price defines value by supply and demand. So if it's scarce, it's valuable. If it's more abundant, it's cheaper. If it's really abundant, it's either dirt cheap or it's worthless. And I suddenly realized, looking at that, that that means that everything that defines you and me as human beings is worthless. Every fundamental capacity that has enabled our species to survive, we've defined by our economic system, by our monetary system, as worthless. Our ability to care for each other, to come to each other's rescue, to grieve, to stand together, to help each other with birthing, all of the fundamental things, to come together and make small decisions or big decisions in small groups, to stand up for its rights to oppose what's wrong, all of those fundamental capacities that we as a species need in order to survive, we've defined by our economic system as worthless. So we're going to have to create a social Prius that operates on both kinds of fuel, both kinds of energy, and both kinds of value systems. That's why I created another currency. And that's the time credit currency where ours were all viewed as equal and that's now spread to 32 countries. But I'm going to simply say that if we don't begin to understand that without building new kinds of social inventions, we won't get there. And if we don't enlist and start to value and find a way to value the work of those whom we're asking to co-produce those outcomes with us, the world will be divided as it tends to be now between paid staff and volunteers. And sooner or later, the volunteers get picked off, okay? And sooner or later, there's a toxic reality to that in terms of anybody who's trying to build community. And until we begin to find a way to build a different kind of reward system and honor and value and validate that, we're going to either have lots of money coming down or like manna from heaven, and even then there won't be enough because that money will devalue, that pricing system will devalue the most essential labor that we need. So we're going to have to build a new operating system, and that's going to take some new algorithms. The first algorithm that's going to have to take is we're going to have to start redefining what we mean by assets so that the mothers who were part of the birthing project, they have value. I remember a senior saying to me when I started doing this work, why were you depressed? Your children just left. They were happy. Your adult children, your grandchildren are doing beautifully. She said, I have nothing left to give but love. I thought, how can we have a system where that's a nothing, as if that's not, not the most precious thing we have to offer? The second thing we're going to have to redefine is what we honor as work. The market does not value caring labor, mentoring labor, civic engagement, social justice labor, environmental labor, or cultural labor. We're going to have to find ways, because it takes work to do all of those things, we're going to have to find a way in building social enterprises to value the kind of work that the market doesn't value. Alvin who's a friend, called me up one day and said, Edgar, I get the point. He said, I explain this to the CEOs and executives of Fortune 500 companies in this way. He said, I asked them how productive their workforce would be if they were not toilet drains. They get the point. The third algorithm we're going to have to write into this new operating system that we're building, this new core economy, I call it reciprocity. Some people call it mutuality. Some people call it pay it forward. When I and my late wife were the creators of the legal service program and we were fighting for its survival in the mid-90s, we had helped 100 million households through different legal service programs. Not a one turned up for that fight. And I thought, we may be doing good, but doing good does not create a constituency for justice. How do we create a constituency for justice with all this work that we're doing? And I said to myself, we've got to ask people to pay it forward, to give back. And so I did that. I went back to the law school where I had a clinic, and I entered into retainers with ministers from churches and from other places and from public housing, and I charged the clients an hour my time for an hour their time, and they went back to their church. When the law school was in trouble, who turns up but those ministers, those congregants, and those public housing complexes and says, you mess with our law school, you won't be here next year. We've had no problem with funding ever since.
Now, I'm simply going to say that we don't look through a lens that sees the value of people who are, quote, trying to help. I can tell you we run a youth court in Washington, D.C. that handles 70% of all the nonviolent crime by juveniles. It's teenagers who sit on the jury talking to other teenagers. I made the breakthrough discovery of knowledge that kids don't listen to adults. I know I'm the first person to ever discover that. And it finally took me 30 years to persuade the judges after they had put over 54% of all African American males in Washington, D.C. in prison or parole or probation that maybe that they were running a feeder system that they didn't want to keep running. So I said to them, why don't you let the kids have a chance? The kids have reduced recidivism by over 50%. Every Saturday, they're handling 20 to 30 cases right here in the courthouse in Washington, D.C. In Chicago, Illinois, we took fifth and sixth graders because I made the amazing discovery that kids don't want to raise their hand and look like they're smart for their teachers because they're afraid of pure ostracism. But I also made the discovery, I know that you don't know, that kids will do anything for praise from an older kid. So we took the fifth and sixth graders who were special ed, ADD, and we had them tutoring the kids after school. Suddenly attendance went up, truancy went down, fighting went down, test scores went up, and we literally got the schools off of academic probation. Prisons in Scotland and in England now, people in prison are earning time dollars that they give to their families in the towns that they're in, creating recycling bicycles for Africa, or just sitting there because they've been taught by the Good Samaritans to listen. I want you to know that basically... We need to start looking at a different lens. You take three people who have returned from prison, you put them on a certain street corner, they can guarantee safe passage for any kid through any gang territory in Washington, D.C. We need to look through the lens of possibility. Now, I've been looking through that lens for a long time. I must admit I had a genetic advantage. I was born with a twin sister, so I never even had the womb to myself. Uh, we need to understand that we are interdependent, that there's no way around that interdependence and that we ought to value that as one of our great strengths and one of our great resources. I'm simply going to say that while the young may lead the revolution, you have 7,918 people passing the age of 60 each and every day for the next 18 years. So maybe there's a resource that you can tap into and use because most of them don't want to spend the rest of their lives playing golf, I think. We need to ask ourselves... Two questions, why are we here, and what kind of a world do we want to leave behind? I remember when I started this, Father Fahey had just become the head of Catholic Charities, and he had started what he called the College for the Third Age. We have to keep learning. We have to keep growing. You've heard that before, but new discoveries show that the mind does not freeze in place, that it's plastic, and it can keep learning and keep growing and keep being vital. I'm hoping for a long, long time to come. In any event, Father Fahey said, I have good news for you and bad news for you, and I can wrap it up in one statement. We have no money. All we have is each other. To me, that's good news. That represents that we have true abundance. Thank you very much. My first job out of Yale Law School was at the Justice Department, and I was assigned to start working on the drafting of what was called the Economic Opportunity Act that others know as the War on Poverty. That was sort of the middle also of the Civil Rights Movement, and the War on Poverty was an attempt to say, how do we move from inequality to opportunity for all? So I feel like I've been doing the same, to, and that was maximum feasible participation, and this is another form of maximum feasible participation. So I feel like I've been doing the same thing in certain ways for decades. He then asked if I would work for his brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, who headed the War on Poverty. And so I went over there and we launched Legal Services, but we also launched VISTA and the Job Corps and Community Action. So it was really an attempt to say programs alone can't do the job. If we can't enlist the community as partners, we can't engage people, people many of whom, whom the market excluded, whether because of race or age or disability, how do we open up opportunities? for all and how do we build the kind of community we want. And I think we're returning to a vision that says maybe those ideas are worth struggling to make real again. A lot of what goes on is invisible. Often we only value things that generate numbers. And so part of the reason I created a kind of currency was currency generates numbers. If the only thing we count for the gross domestic product is how many pounds sterling are exchanged, that's a very limited definition of what goes on. So if our goal is to create community, 
how do we make that generate numbers, and how do we create what are called a different measure of GDP, a civic GDP, 10%, 20% growth in civic GDP in terms of activity that's generated and recorded and that links in turn to rewards and incentives. We've got the power to solve the problems if we begin to think differently about what's available to us. We're used to thinking of money as the only medium of exchange, as if it was somehow handed down on Sinai. But when you change the characteristics of a medium of exchange, you change the dynamics that flow from each of those characteristics. Think of grading and academic credits as a medium of exchange that we award that people earn much as a medium of exchange and we award credits and degrees. If you change the grading system, if you change what you award units of credit for, if you award credits for community service, if you move from a decimal point system of 4.0 to a grading system of ABCD and then to pass fail, you change the educational dynamics. Well, that's how when you change the characteristics of a medium of exchange, you radically alter the dynamics that it generates. That's why time banking is such an important way to vary the medium of exchange. I started off really looking at the issue of money and what money measured and realized that just to ask that question was to ask a pretty fundamental question because when I started, and I may have made the mistake or not, but my biggest asset was my ignorance. So I started off at the London School of Economics and they gave me this statement by Alfred Pagu that said, economic welfare is that part of social welfare that can be brought directly or indirectly into relationship with the measuring rod of money. And I dared to suggest what would happen if we changed the measuring rod. Could changing the measuring rod change our definition of reality? How much of what we thought was reality, what we thought was economic reality, came from the characteristics of the measuring rod called money, and how many of them came from the underlying reality that money did not measure? You can deliver pizza, you can deliver packages, but you cannot deliver health, or education, or community, or justice, or well-being. That's not a unilateral transaction. You must enlist the people whom you're helping, whom you're working with, as your partners, as your co-workers, and as your co-producers. That was the understanding that underlay the proposition of co-production, that we need to reframe our approach to social problems from the ways in which we do things to those which enlist those whom we're helping and working with as our partners. The math is pretty simple. It's one equals one, and I think we can manage that. It takes a person to a person and a half to manage the core time bank, but off of that you can spin any number of satellite banks with people who are part-time handling this estate or this neighborhood or this organization. You need a person who's out there reaching, pulling people together, doing the matching, who knows the chemistry, and usually that's a different person from somebody who puts the data into the computer bank because that's a different kind of sense of commitment and giving. We're wired historically to deal with danger and with threat. So we have adrenaline glands and we know how to respond to danger and we know how to compete with each other and we know how to deal with adversaries. But there's another part of us which is wired to deal with collaboration, with friendship, with altruism, with caring. There's a book, Mothers and Others, that suggests we're descended from primates who knew how to entrust their children to a kin, uh, to an aunt or an uncle or a brother or a sister because if the male was killed, the mother could not raise the children. So we have a long period of adolescence and childhood before we're self-sufficient. And that ability to care for each other, to rely on each other, to be interdependent is the other part of our nature that I think is as key as our ability to fight and compete. Maybe the most important thing one could be was a human being. I know that's a strange belief, but to the best of my knowledge, this is what brings us together here. Because I have to tell you, as far as I know, Adam Smith was not a founding father. There are a few folks called Jefferson and Washington and a few others. And then you may remember those words that started us off down this path, called we hold these truths to be 
self-evident that all edited persons are created equal, that we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, that amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, maybe we needed an economic system that embodied and perpetuated those beliefs and translated those beliefs into an economic reality because nobody paid the people to come here. To the best of my knowledge, the folks who did the sit-ins were not paid minimum wage and negotiated minimum wage. To the best of my knowledge, those of us who were part of the struggle against apartheid or part of the struggle to protect endangered species. This wasn't about money. This was about who we were as human beings. But the problem is nowadays, whatever we used to be, we used to know each other as neighbors. We used to know that there were extended families, there was somebody in the family who knew how to sew, somebody who knew how to do hair, somebody who knew how to do shopping, somebody who could do the books. So we had interdependence within families, and then we came to know our neighbors. But my guess is that most of us don't even know what our neighbors are. I think all of us have domains of value that we know are too important to allow to market price to define them. It may be our children and our loved ones, it may be our community, it may be patriotism, it may be the environment, it may be social justice, it may be democracy. But we all know there are things we care about that we should not give a price to that are beyond price. And I think those are the areas where the activity, the energy, and the work that it takes to build the kind of world we want is going to require everybody. I saw a five-year-old go up to a former gang leader after we had negotiated a truce, and she said to him, we have trash cans here, and we use them, which is not a job I would willingly undertake. But she was earning time dollars because she wanted to earn dance lessons. I remember in West Virginia, a veteran had come back. We've got veterans coming back who really need a new family and a new way of entry. And this woman in a wheelchair said, I help him do his job. And I turned in, and he looked like a weightlifter. I was like, well, you, you're helping him? She, he said, yeah, I came back scared of people. And the job I could get was training C&I dogs. And C&I dogs have to learn to be around people in wheelchairs. And so she had turned her deficit into an asset for him. I think this is about turning what people think are limitations into assets because all of us can give. I think that the key ingredient is memory. If I'm only going to see you once, I have a choice between whether I hit you over the head and take your money or whether I treat you as I would want to be treated. But if I'm going to see you tomorrow, I'm going to think twice about what I do today. And if there's a collective memory of how I've treated other people so that I can only gain access to other people if I act in a way that, that I would want them to treat me, then I think that the, the creation of memory around transactions is probably the single most important feature in creating trust among strangers. There is another ingredient, and I would call that reciprocity. If I help you, you will, and we've all had this experience, we help somebody and they say, how can I give back? How can I help you? And sometimes we smile and say, it was my privilege. But we don't realize that the message that we're sending is undermining that trust. Because we're saying, how can I help you? But the message we're sending is, I have something you need, but you have nothing that I need or want or value. And the only thing that you have that interests me is your problems. So if your only asset is your problems, then we don't make any inroads on social problems. So I would say trust comes with both memory, the connectivity that a medium of exchange creates when it links people together through a transaction, and what I'll call a pay-it-forward transaction where I can pay you back by helping somebody else. And I think those become two of the critical ingredients both to building trust and building community. I think we're wired as beings with two kinds of impulses. One is the impulse for caring and sharing and sort of long-range thinking about the next generation. And the other, frankly, is the ability to defend ourselves with fear and aggression and competitiveness. I think we need both to survive. I think that money does a brilliant job in generating a reward for competitiveness that produces remarkable achievements and that also rations scarcity.
So I think that it will continue to be invaluable in getting people to produce brilliant breakthroughs, one kind or another. And it will also be useful in portioning scarcity. I just don't think it's designed to reward the other impulse of caring and reaching out and thinking about the unborn and the next generation and the planet. I think that takes a reward for, of a different kind. And so I think that we need to understand that market does some things very well, but it doesn't deal with the externalities it creates. I think those externalities need to be dealt with by investing in the creation of a complementary system that rewards the complementary labor it's going to take to preserve the planet and make neighborhoods safe, make communities the kind of place we want to live. I would say the most important thing that one can do to teach a person to show empathy, to learn what empathy is, is to have them in helping that person enable that person to give back or to pay it forward in some way so that they feel as good in helping as the person who helped them by showing compassion. What I've suggested to time banks in the states is why doesn't a time bank offer to help the legislative officials, the executive officials with citizen inquiries and then report back to them and then God forbid if somebody does a good job you could actually praise them. I know that's an insane idea but also if a person wasn't satisfied you'd have a witness and another time bank member to say he gave him a runaround, he didn't really respond to what he wanted and so what I'm saying is maybe a joint job would be how do we make government more responsive to the needs of people and the answer is we need to do it in partnership with community and why don't we try and find a mechanism in one community actually set up a citizen's complaint office and the government then partnered with the citizen complaint office run by the time bank to jointly deal with the problems. If you think of a paradigm as a kind of a map, we've been following a map that we need to start revising. That includes, we define clients only in terms of their problems, not in terms of their strengths. We define them as consumers, and we don't think of them as partners or co-producers of solutions. We also, in my profession and other professions, elevate privacy and confidentiality as absolutes leaving the very people we're helping as isolated, as vulnerable, as with one less crisis than before they saw us. We define the economy in terms of money and work in terms of what you get paid to do. We define economic prosperity in terms of the GDP and we define value pretty much exclusively in terms of price. All of those, I think, are part of an old paradigm that we have to leave behind and we have to think radically differently. Brianne Eisler has written a book, The Chalice and the Shield, that talks about partnering culture and a predatory culture. Well, I think money has built into it predatory DNA, and I think time banking has built into it partnering and pairing DNA. That DNA built into money is about, do you have more? It's quantitative, not qualitative, and it values scarcity and rewards scarcity. It does not reward, it devalues whatever is abundant. If it devalues whatever is abundant, it devalues every capacity that is universal that enabled our species to survive. I think it's about time we started to reward those better impulses, the impulse to care for each other, to come to each other's rescue, to stand up for what's right, to oppose what's wrong, to grieve together, to celebrate together, to come together and make decisions. All of those universal capacities are not scarce. So we devalue them and we only value what money values. As long as we only value what is scarce, we will not be rewarding and reinforcing those impulses that were critical to our species' survival. And that's why I think complementary currencies in general and time banking in particular has something to offer. It can readjust the balance in how we function. This is our government. We're a democracy. A government is just people. It's my government, and as far as I'm concerned, the government is my servant. If my servant misbehaves, then i, I got to step in.
People actually have earned time dollars in social protests. They've earned time dollars in picketing in front of enterprises that don't honor minimum wage requirements. But I think we've seen what happens when government turns its back and doesn't do its job. We've seen what the banking industry does. We're all living with that. Government is our entity. That we mean we cannot act collectively to fulfill our mission as a people. That, to my mind, defy everything that, that this country was built on. We wouldn't have a government if people didn't rise up and say, we need a government, we need to stand up against England. We need to stand up against tyranny. To the best of my knowledge, this government fought World War II, now struggling to do all kinds of remarkable things around the world. So to demonize government is to prey on people's fear. And it's to appeal to their fears and to make them as scared as possible. I think it's entirely a struggle around political power. Every time, frankly, the right wing, from my point of view, has gotten power, they've made government bigger and they, they've used governmental power to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. I don't think that's the best use of government, but they have a track record of building a bigger government and using government to extract money from those who have least. Probably the scarcest commodity right now is knowing whom to trust and feeling you can turn to somebody who's even a stranger but whom you can trust actually in your own home. And what we found is that the knowledge that there's a memory, that transactions are known, means that in all of these years, 18 years in the state, 6 years here, there has been only one theft in millions of transactions and that was a teenager who stole a cell phone and within hours in a very troubled estate everybody was down on that kid. It's it's a matter of saying, well, I'm not going to mess up my bank account because I may need somebody someday. And so it creates a new way of imparting the golden rule. We've made partnerships between time banks and the agencies which are suffering the cutbacks but are still funded to address critical social problems. We know that the amount of the money to provide homemaker services to the elderly is going to be cut, but that doesn't mean the answer is nursing homes. We know that therefore creating an informal support system that puts a light bulb in the ceiling or digs up the ground when it's frozen so they can have a community garden, that's important, but there'll never be money for that. We know that the kids who don't reach reading grade level in third grade need help because both California and Indiana, that's what they project prison growth on, believe it or not. And so I've taken fifth and sixth graders earning time dollars to two of them, and lo and behold, kids learn when they can get the approval and praise of an older kid. Big discovery, but that we're learning, and they earn time dollars, and they've gotten recycled computers. So we're taking what would be throwaway kids, throwaway computers, and turning them into winners. The youth court that I run, the jury is all teenagers earning time dollars, and believe it or not, teenagers listen to teenagers. So we don't see a single social problem where time banking can't be used in partnership with the efforts of professionals and the efforts of government and philanthropy to really address the needs that we're going to see continuing and growing. I'm seeing now, and I'm getting that feeling here, that there's an openness to these ideas that didn't exist a few years ago. And so I'm feeling very optimistic about, really about two things. One is, I think that we're going to see an understanding, and I'm having actually some studies done on what are called return on investment. People want to know what's the multiplier effect. And in fact, what we're seeing, particularly in the health and elder care field, is that the return on investment in terms of money saved that would be true in prisons and recidivism too. But the return on investment can be quantified and it's very, very impressive. Then I'm in dialogue with the uh, government to say, why aren't you asking the folks who you fund to deliver services and why aren't you rewarding them if they can come up with in-kind match in citizen participation hours by partnering with or by starting a time bank? Because government needs to get a multiplier effect on its service dollars and time banking is a way, an in-kind match is a way of talking about that and getting the folks who are delivering services to also be, in effect, community organizers at the same time. The notion of creating another kind of currency with another kind of value system is tricky. Barter currencies have always flourished in hard times and then collapse when, quote, good times come. Time banking is not part of the barter currency world. 
because it's rooted and based outside of the commercial economy where money changes hands and it's really in the economy of family and neighborhood, community, kinfolk, civil society. I think that it's difficult for people to think of it in terms of money. It's difficult for people to think in terms of asking for help or using it to mobilize. And possibly one of the most difficult aspects of it is that helping professionals are trained to say, how can I help you? But they're not trained to say, I need what you can do as badly as you need what I can do. And until we begin to get that understanding that we need each other and that we can't build the kind of world we all want without a degree of mutuality and reciprocity built in, and until we begin looking at people beyond their resumes and their marketable skills and look at the whole person, we're going to lose. It's going to be difficult. We do not consider how good a teacher Mother Teresa was. I don't know how good an attorney Gandhi was. I don't even know how good a carpenter Jesus was. And I really don't think I care about that because I really think what we value and respect and revere about those people is what kind of a human being they are, what kind of spirits they had. But that's not on your resume. That's not a marketable skill. Those are more important than marketable skills. But we so live like the fish in water. We so live in the world of money that we don't understand the extent to which that limits our whole appreciation of how we have to proceed. Time banking from one point of view is a kind of money that people earn by helping each other, by building community, hopefully by advancing and furthering social justice. For every hour you put in, you get one-time credit or one-time dollar, and that goes in your bank account. You can then spend that to get help for yourself, for your family. You can donate it to another organization, a nonprofit or a church or, or some publicly funded organization in order to advance a purpose. So it's a medium of exchange that is about doing good. The IRS has ruled consistently that it's tax exempt because we value every hour equally. So my time as a lawyer, time as somebody doing gardening, the time as a teenager teaching other kids math, all of those hours are equal. And so we've avoided commercial pricing, and it's not backed by a legal obligation of I can't sue you on a time dollar debt. It's a moral obligation, and so the IRS says we don't acknowledge the existence of moral obligations, so we can't tax something that doesn't exist. It's used to build community. It's used to provide support for seniors who might otherwise have to go into nursing home. It's being used to keep juveniles who otherwise would go into detention in community. It's used for people returning from prison. It's used for families that have kids who are bipolar and autistic. The, the range of uses is as creative as people want to be. If you think of a computer and the icons on the screen, the Word and WordPerfect or Excel or PowerPoint, you know that if the operating system goes down, buying the newest version of Word will not fix it. You have to go right into that operating system and either go into the registry or you have to upgrade the version of Windows that you have. Well, I think of our economy very much like a computer. I think the monetary economy, just as the computer runs highly specialized programs, I think the monetary economy itself runs very specialized, very powerful, and even multi-purpose programs. But it is not the operating system. The operating system itself is households, family, kinfolk, neighbors, friends, social networks, community, civil society. It's not part of the GDP. We don't measure it. We don't consider it what it does to be part of the GDP. It doesn't do anything of economic significance. It just raises children, keeps families strong, makes neighborhoods safe, turns out people for elections, holds officials accountable, fights for social justice, preserves endangered species, and hopefully makes the planet sustainable, but nothing of economic importance, you understand. And I think that when we talk about time banking, we're talking about how do we rebuild core economy? How do we rebuild the operating system? Because the old core economy ran off of significant chunks of labor extracted from the subordination of women, the exploitation of immigrants, the exploitation of ethnic minorities, and in some cases the exploitation of children. So whatever that nifty core economy that we have a nostalgic romantic idea about, we've got to build a new core economy and that new core economy means that we've got to write some new algorithms and we've got to upgrade that whole operating system. We have to begin to honor as real work the work that it takes 
to make democracy work, the work that it takes to raise children, the work that it takes to care for the elderly, the work that it takes to fight for social justice. Caring labor, civic labor, social justice labor, environmental labor, cultural labor are all devalued by the market. There's no money to pay for that. But we better start figuring out how to pay for it because that labor happens to be essential to building the kind of world we want. In 2050, there will still be money. Time banking will be part of a universal tradition because on the one hand, money is very effective in rationing scarcity, but it's not awfully good in rationing abundance and in distributing abundance. And we have the capacity to produce all that we need in terms of material goods. The question of how we distribute access to that and how we distribute access to education and to opportunity and development that's a matter of how we distribute abundance, and I believe that all people will have the ability, if they're willing in some decades, to spend, say, 20 hours helping others, at least to be guaranteed an adequate level of sustainable life and opportunity to develop and contribute. Professor Edgar Kahn, and I am both a professor of law and founder of Time Banking and founder of Time Banks USA. Thank uh -huh.